Now, Reverend Mason and I have something in common. We've gone to the cemetery many, many times. And I remember back in July the 3rd, when I was uh, in 8th grade that summer, that my mom died. And I remember laying on mom and dad's bed and just crying. And I remember it felt like a door was slammed in my face. And as we go through life, we might understand the resurrection. I had a mental understanding, surely because my dad was the pastor of this uh, great Presbyterian church. But it needs to move, if we are to have Easter light, to move from our heads to our hearts. And as it comes into our hearts, there's a new confidence, there's a new expression and there's a new way to live life. And so I call this sermon, Sight by Easter's Light, because we have the possibility of seeing things that we can see beyond this earth. One of my favorite stories uh, uh, on this theme, it was given to me by uh, Reverend Howard Luckock, and he told a very old story. This story goes before World War I, before radio, and they had in the Winchester Cathedral, they had a verger. Now, a verger is the guy, when you see a royal wedding in England, he's the guy that has like this big stick, sort of like a big baton, and he leads the procession. And he's in charge of the cathedrals, where, wherever they are, there's a verger for each one. And this one was in London, England, at the Winchester Cathedral, and he would give people tours of this beautiful cathedral during the week. And he would like to close his tour by standing on the rooftop and telling them the story of Wellington's victory over Napoleon. And the reason I'm sharing this is it's going to show us the importance of catching the whole story of Jesus. Well, when Napoleon fought Wellington at the Battle of Waterloo, it was a close battle, and Napoleon was a genius in military. Fortunately, that day he was a bit sick, and just at the right time, reinforcements came from Germany, and in the end, Wellington defeated the enemy. Now, if he lost, it meant that Napoleon would take all his armies and cross the sea and become the dictator of England. So it's a scary thing for England. Just as the other countries had been conquered uh, by Napoleon, he took their people and made them his soldiers. He always had a big army. Now, they would communicate back then in the early 1800s by semaphore. And as a scout, we had semaphore flags. That's how old I am. We had things we had to learn. And you can give a message by waving flags. And then the next hill, the people would catch the message signal back what the message was, and the person would say, you have it right, then they would send it to the next hill. Well, the message got as far as the English Channel, and then they would send the message from ship to ship by these semaphore flags. It finally reaches southern England. It makes it into London to the Winchester Cathedral, and people who were on the ball would watch for the news by the semaphore flags on Winchester Cathedral. They knew how to read it, and they would get the news first. And they were watching because they knew that great battle was going on, and they saw the flag come in. Wellington, they spelled that out. Defeated. And you know it rains all the time over there and have fog? The fog came in. Now, they are celebrating in France and Germany. Wellington's army is celebrating the people in London are despondent. They saw the message. Wellington was defeated. It's like on Good Friday and Saturday. It looks like Jesus is defeated. The fog lifts. The semaphores keep going. Wellington defeated the enemy. And the sadness is transformed into great joy. Now, the point of sight by Easter light is this. Easter happened. 
There's an earthquake about 3 o'clock in the morning. It's right on the fault line all the way through Israel into Africa. The stone is bounced away. The temple guards run away in fear. And the stone, is the tomb is open not to let Jesus out. He had a new kind of body. It was to let the people in and see it's empty. Now the question is, could they believe Jesus? And it looks like no. And that morning, even though Jesus is alive, they are suffering and they're crying and they're, the disciples are hiding out in a special place, probably the upper room. And there are two groups of women go before dawn and they look a sight. When you mourn back then, you have ashes on your face, your hair is all down looking terrible, your clothes are ripped, and you're walking barefoot to feel each stone to help the pain out of grief. And they are going to go to the grave to do a better job. Joseph of Arimathea had donated his tomb. Nicodemus, who came by Jesus at nighttime, he brought 80 to 100 pounds of spices, you know, myrrh and other spices, for the burial. And the women said, guys don't know how to do that right. We're going to do the job right. But they were worried. The stone is sealed. What are we going to do? And we can't push that stone aside. It's, it's, in, a, it's in a deep rut. What are we going to do? Well, Mary Magdalene, well, with the women, one group, or two groups, one room, group of three and Mary Magdalene. When the group of three comes, this is the issue, they walk in and see the tomb. It's all, everything's gone. And they see two messengers. Angel means messenger. There are two messengers in white sitting at the head and foot of where Jesus' body would have been. And they said this to them. What are you doing? Why do you seek the living among the dead? So well, that's a good question. For me, my grandparents, my mom, my dad, my brother, my niece, a nephew, Betty's family, they've gone on to be with God. And you may go to the cemetery too and see the graves. And that's respectful. But the messengers, messengers say this, Pastor Ed, why do you seek the living among the dead and that sight by Easter light, can I go from my head to my heart and know they're not lost to me. I know where they are. That gives us a special way to live life today. It hurts when we lose our loved ones, but we don't hurt as those who have no hope. Now, I just love the story of Mary Magdalene. She comes and sees the, the tomb empty. No one's there when she sees it, and she figures out what happened. A bad day got worse. The tomb's robbed. They stole the body, and she's so upset. Now remember, she's crying. She has charcoal on her face, and uh, her clothes are ripped, and she gets as fast as she can to where the disciples are, pounds on the door, it's me. I mean, they're locking the doors. They don't want to be caught by the soldiers to be crucified too. They're hiding out. It's me. It's Mary. They let her in, and she announces to the disciples, they stole the body. Look, there's no faith. There's, there's nothing here that they could have believed Jesus. And there's no evidence that they believed Jesus at all, that he was going to rise from the dead. They saw him dead. Thomas said, I saw that spear go into his side and the heart, the blood and the, the water around the heart gushed out. You know, the holes were in his hands and feet. He's dead. Our dreams are dashed and they are suffering. They're thinking, they're kicking themselves. We should have kept Jesus away from Jerusalem. We knew it was dangerous. We should have just held him. And he felt so guilty for running away. And they felt so sad. They felt so stupid. They were fighting over who was going to have the chief places in the kingdom. And there was no kingdom they could see. And so they're just totally dashed. Their hopes are gone. And now the w news gets worse with Mary Magdalene. And they may have said to each other, I'm worried about her. She's falling apart. 
You see how she looked? Those ashes and everything. She looks awful. Well, Peter and John say, we'll find out what's going on. They run. They run outside to the city, and they come to the place. Now, when I went on my Holy Land trip um, over 10 years ago, we came to a place called uh, Gordon's Garden Tomb. Now, Gordon, General Gordon was a great general in the British Army in the late 1800s. He's kind of famous, too, because he lost a huge battle. He got killed in a battle in Sudan called at the city of Khartoum. He was very famous. But before he died, he was in Jerusalem. He's stationed there with the British Army, and he sees a hillside that looks like a skull. And he thinks, I know my Bible. Jesus was crucified at Golgotha, which translate the place of the skull. Something looked like a skull to the people, and they called it Golgotha. Could this be it? He checks it out. There's a tomb there. And then they find out later that under that area was a huge water cistern, the second biggest in the whole area around Jerusalem. It's huge. He knew there was a garden there. And so now, British priest, Anglican priest, go there, and they serve two to three months. They take care of this whole garden area, a little store to sell things, and they show off the garden tomb. And there with the other ministers, I officiated with Holy Communion. And I asked one of the priests, do you think that was the tomb? And he said, yes. Pastor Ed, you can read my name tag. I, I believe that's the tomb. And I, I looked in there, and there's a slab on one side where you could sit and mourn, and then off to the side, and they had b- iron bars there, because tourists were trying to chip off pieces of rock, that uh, you could see three slabs where they could put three bodies. Now, what happens is this. Peter and John are running. John's younger. He gets there, and you've got to kind of stoop. And the Bible says he stoops, looks in. Kind of spooky in a grave. He's just kind of looking in. And Peter just runs right in. Peter looks around, sees the uh, linens from the body, and he, he sees the uh, head cloth. And John comes in. John sort of studies this. That head cloth is really, really special. It's folded. And, and when I was there, the, the guide said that back in Jesus' day, you didn't write things out on paper. Uh, if you were a carpenter, the job was done. You would take a towel, wrap it a certain way, and it meant it's finished, you could pick it up. So the guide said it could have been the towel was wrapped in such a way that said, it is finished. And John says, who writes the Gospel of John, that's when I believed. But he doesn't say anything. Peter and John go back. Now Mary Magdalene finally gets there again. And in the confusion that we see in this scripture that was in her mind, remember, she looks a fright. She's awful. The, the charcoal could be going in her eyes now. And she wonders, where's the body? I want to do it right. And she sees a person, as she looks in the tomb, she sees a person here. Now the sun is just coming up into her eyes, and she, the tears are in her eyes and some charcoals in her eyes, and she thinks it's the gardener. And she says with great respect, Sir, if you tell me where you put the body, I'll go take care of it. Now, she's going to get sight by Easter light. And it's not her scene. Her eyes are kind of messed up with the charcoal and the tears. She hears one word. Mary. Nobody said her name like that. It's, she says, Rabboni, teacher, it's you. Well, she says, don't touch me, I'm still ascending to the Father. She goes back. Now the disciples are sad, they're despondent, and here's the thing. Mary has good news for them. Knocking on the door, I'm back. And look at her. Charcoal's on her face, her hair's all stringy, her clothes are, are ripped, and now it's worse, she's smiling. They look at her, and she says, Jesus is alive, I saw him. And they say, you're nuts. 
you had a hallucination. And they're saying to each other, she's gone off the deep, deep end. Now here's the problem. Sight by Easter light takes some faith. Either we hear Jesus' word in the scriptures, and by faith, Jesus says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, that he gives us a white stone with, with a new name on it. He calls you by name. He calls me by name. You're special to him. He likes you. He loves you. But by faith, can we hear him say our name? That's it for Mary. The disciples don't have sight by Easter light until 6 o'clock tonight. Easter has happened. Jesus is alive, and they're miserable until 6 tonight. Jesus appears to them. And one more guy, Thomas says, I had enough earlier. He leaves. He's gone when Jesus appears, and we'll hear about him next week. He has a whole bad week. He does not have Easter sight. And that's the message. Could we trust the Gospels? Could we trust John and his accounts? Could we trust our Lord and know that, okay, Jesus loves me. He's alive. But then let it come to our hearts and let our hearts be warmed by the sight from Easter light. Amen.